bit of a Bible survey. And that is to say that normally I teach and uh, Dave teaches through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Normally I would be in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20 today. And indeed, I started down that path. And then I got a phone call from somebody asking a question. And the question was along these lines. Say, Ron, doesn't the Bible say somewhere a principle that there is a special covering over the children of unbelievers? I'm sorry, over the children of believers. And if so, where is that in Scripture? And uh, I thought, well, I'll just start looking into this. I've got a couple minutes I can dedicate to it. I'm in the middle of preparing Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 34. So I'll just give it a little bit of time. And I, I went down a rabbit hole, and it got deeper, and it got deeper. And then I think the Lord just showed me clearly, this is your message, Ron. This is your message this week. So give it time and give uh, thought to the answer that you give. So I I completed an email, and then I sent uh, a one-page email to this person. Here's here's what I have found. And uh, as always, when when I give that kind of counsel, I'm open to being corrected. Could be wrong. But uh, I, believe it's, I believe it's correct, and I'm, I want to expound upon it for you here today. Doesn't the Bible say something about there being a special covering for the children of believers? See, every believing parent's most fervent desire is that his child or children be saved and go to heaven. We would all agree with that, wouldn't we? And there's a school of thought that says that the children of unbelievers have a special protective covering over them, and that there is a promise or a principle that if parents raise their children the right way, then the children will become believers themselves eventually. Generally, the focus of this belief is along a few key scriptures. One of the ones that is often used is Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you kind of a glimpse into uh, the, the, the end game of this message. I was not able to find an, uh, a more or less ironclad promise in Scripture that if we as parents just do the right thing, that there is a promise that, that, those, that our children will come into heaven. It's not quite that clean. However, there is cause for hope. And as the parent of a child who just died, who did not profess Jesus Christ as Lord to his community, I still have hope. And someday I'll get into that with you exactly why but let me just touch on the periphery of it here. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, and I'll just turn there, says this. Yes. You keep getting phone calls. You're getting a lot of phone calls here. Um, It looks like it's working. Yes. It's asking me, finish, question mark? No. Are you having a... It's not live streaming. It was on. It's on. Now it's on. See what happens when you give technology to fifty year olds plus. I know it's on because Gina's watching. It says Gina's watching. Hi, Gina. (laughs) 
So Proverbs 22, 6 goes like this. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But that's in the middle of uh, a list of Proverbs. It goes, starts this way. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. These are all lessons in the way that we should go. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. These are all lessons in how we can preserve our soul and, and please God and live a victorious life. And if we teach these lessons to our children, then when they are old, they will not depart from them. But remember, this is the book of Proverbs. These are Proverbs, not laws. These are Proverbs, not doctrine, although we get some doctrine from the book of Proverbs. So they're not guarantees. They're true. But we need to be mature in how we understand Proverbs. For example, in that same chapter, verse 10, cast out the scoffer and contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. However, from our own experience, don't we know that that is not an ironclad promise? It doesn't happen 100. If you cast out a scoffer, does all contention cease 100% of the time? No, but it's a general rule, and it generally happens that way. And in fact, this verse, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, should be a cause of huge encouragement to us. The general rule is this. You train up your child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's an awesome rule. That's an awesome uh, principle. It's not an ironclad guarantee. If it was, it would be a formula. And all you would need to do is check the box. But as with many things, there is a deeper commitment called for in the believer in order to bring about the fulfillment of many of these principles. Let's dive into it. Please, there's hope, there's hope here, okay? So stay with me. Then also, there are numerous references to blessings upon future generations and to curses upon future generations. I'll just go back to uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Okay, a thousand generations is a lot of generations. To give you some perspective, I did some math, the entire church age is less than 90 generations old. That's not many generations. The entire church age is less than 90 generations old. So when we say a thousand generations, you're talking about back to Adam. And so if somebody in Adam's generation was faithful to God, if this is an ironclad promise of blessing, then, then we are entitled to blessing for an, another hundreds and hundreds of generations. There's a principle here, though. And that is this, if you do the right thing and if you pursue God, your children have an advantage. They get a leg up. They get to come from a Christian family. How many children in the world can say, I came from a believing Christian home with a consistent witness? Numbers 14, this speaks of in, uh, iniquity being imputed to future generations. The Lord is slow to anger. Numbers 14, verse 18, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It's true. God is merciful. God is abounding in mercy and steadfast love, and he is slow to anger. He's for, he forgives iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Is that a promise? Is that a formula? Does that mean that if you're sinful, that your children and their children and their children are doomed? It is not. 
It's a principle that the sins of the fathers will set at disadvantage the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. Some of you have been saved out of alcoholic homes, out of homes with abusive parents. Maybe you don't even know who your parents are because you were adopted out at an early age. Does that mean you're doomed? It does not. Your ancestry is not your destiny. You can escape whatever your parents and your grandparents did before you in sin, and you will be blessed by what your parents and grandfathers did before you in obedience to God. Blessing will be upon you. You will start off at an advantage. You will have a heritage to look back on. There's cause for hope. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. Now we see that righteousness and wickedness belong to each generation only. So listen to this. Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul who sins shall die. Which soul shall die? The one that sins not the one that is born to the one who sins. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father. It seems to contradict the previous verse that I just gave you, but it does not. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. If you are righteous, you are righteous for yourself. You cannot give that to your children through your DNA. It doesn't work that way. You cannot give your righteousness to your children based strictly upon the fact that they're your children and that they're raised in your home. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. There's the flip side of that coin. One can be a wicked parent, but Jesus can save the children of the wicked. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says this, along similar lines. Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. Praise God that there is no iniquity imputed to the children of the wicked. Praise God that the blessing of the parents can be carried forth to the children by way of preparing their way straightening a road for them. But ultimately, we shall see that the children need to decide, am I going to travel down that road that was carefully prepared for me by my parents? So I could be wrong, but I am not seeing a principle in Scripture that believing parents will bring about a protective covering over their children so strong that you can be assured that God will override the rebellion or the persistent disbelief of, a pra- of your children. I'm sorry. God will not overcome the rebellion of anybody against their will. He makes an invitation to salvation. And it's up to each one of us to accept his invitation. So what then? Where is the hope of our children being saved? Where is the hope of our children being saved and entering that eternal reward in heaven? The answer, it is the same for our children as it is for us. Salvation comes by faith in Christ, by being born again. Question, well, isn't there anything I can do to help that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Of course there is. And here we go. Praying for our children is the most obvious choice that comes to mind. But there is so much more than prayer. Let's look at it. We're going to dive in. The Bible does not give us a model prayer to pray for the salvation of our children. It does give us a model prayer to pray for our salvation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Say it with me. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Amen and amen. That is a prayer for our salvation. This is the same prayer that our children need to pray in their own words, of course. But we do not have a model prayer to pray for the salvation of our children. In fact, the Bible doesn't prompt promise that even if we pray fervently, our children will be saved. There simply is no guarantee. But there is guidance, and there are principles to remember as we pray, as we pray, as we are in a continual state of prayer, and as we teach and lead and influence our children. These principles do not direct us how to pray for our children, but they direct us in what we should be and what we should do while we live out our lives before our children in faith as we pray. This is the key to all this. It's not what you pray, it's how you pray, and how you pray and live before your children. I'm going to give a dozen guiding principles to remember as we pray for our children's salvation. Don't bother taking notes. I'm going to send this all out to all of you by email this week. So I will send you my notes. Principle number one, God loves your children even more than you do. How do we know? Because the Father himself sent his only begotten Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. And many of you have seen this in The Chosen, haven't you? I know you. You've been watching The Chosen. It's so good. And Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came and he said, uh, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, and he says, aren't you the teacher of Israel, yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. This is how much he loves your children. God gave his own. How much do you love your children? Do you love your children enough to give up their life for somebody else? I can't claim that I do, but I know one who does, and that is our Father in heaven. He loved the world so much that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It is God's will that your children have eternal life. That is his earnest desire. For God did not send his Son into the, into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through him might be saved. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You see, it is condemnation comes through deliberate disbelief. Deliberate disbelief. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You see, God loves your child more than you do. I trust God with my child. We have to be cautious about who we trust our children with. Teachers pastors, babysitters, neighbors, especially in today's age. We watch, we hover, we vet those who watch our children. You don't have to vet God. You can give your children to God and turn your back and know that they are well cared for. Here's something that God thinks about your children as well and his intent for giving you children. Principle number two, every child is a blessing from God. Therefore, they are intended by God to be a blessing and to not be a curse to you or to anyone. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. 
Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Your children are a blessing. They don't feel like it all the time. They are a blessing. Number three, your child is not yours to get, to keep. Your child is not yours to keep. Your child is entrusted to you for a short time to be a guide, to send that child on his or her way to pleasing God, to salvation. You are nothing more, and I am nothing more than a steward over the souls of our children. Hannah knew this in 1 Samuel chapter 1. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, and now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and do not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. This is not a prescription for us, but it is a description of a very faithful parent saying, Lord, I know where children come from. I know that they're a blessing from you, and I know that they're really not mine to keep, but to give back to you. And this is a model for what we should, how we should be towards our children. And God does not actually want harm to come to our children. There is a model of this in Genesis chapter 22. And a model of this giving back of the child. And this is Abram. And Abram was called by God to give up his son Isaac that he had waited so long for. Him. And at one time he was called upon he was called by God to sacrifice his son. And as Abraham raised his hand with the knife in it to plunge it into the heart of his son to sacrifice his son or to kill his son with that knife, he, that is God, said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. God does not want us to withhold our children from him, but to give our children to him. And so each one of us is confronted with the question, by God, do you trust me with your child? May we each be found trusting, trusting God with our child. Number four, remember that God wants all people to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 5 says this, Therefore, I exhort first that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of, our, of God our Savior, who desires, what? That all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants your child to be saved. He's rooting for your child to be saved. He's anticipating that your child should be saved. You are not working upstream against God when you beat down his throne room doors, beseeching him to save your child. He is essentially saying, yes, this is a pleasant sound in my ears. I keep hearing that knocking on the door of my throne room. I'm happy to hear it. Number five, the children of a marriage with even just one believing parent have a special condition in their favor. Namely this, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Did you know that the definition of a Christian home is a home which has one Christian? You don't need everybody in the home to be united in their Christian faith for it to be a Christian home. One person in the home who is a believer sanctifies that entire home. The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. 
Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. They're holy. If you are a believing parent, your children are holy unto God. What does that mean? In God's temple were many vessels of gold and silver, and they were holy to the Lord. Not that they were perfect, but that they were dedicated to the Lord's service. They were created for service to the Lord. The Lord looked upon those implements in the temple, knowing that these are acceptable to be in my temple. I look with favor upon these implements. These implements are set apart unto me, as your children are set apart unto the Lord, because you believe. Your children are holy to the Lord. Does that mean that they are saved? No does not. It means that they are holy to the Lord. Does that give them an advantage over somebody else who does not have a believing parent? I have to say yes. Is that fair? I don't know. That's a worldly concept, this whole business of is that fair? You can't find fairness in Scripture, and neither can I. It's not there. What's there is God's will. And so we don't Judge God by what is fair and unfair, but I can see from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that because there is one believing parent in my house, my children are holy unto the Lord. They're holy. Number six, in all your praying, do you ever feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling and coming back down? If you do, You are wrong. God is listening. He hears your prayers. James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 says this. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. This is a command of God to pray for one another that you may be healed. Notice that it begins with confession. For the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. There's several things that we can take away from this with regards to our prayer. Prayer begins with confession. Confession to whom? To one another. I have a challenge for all of us. When you sin against your child, do you confess that sin to your child? You should. How can your child feel love for a God when that God has given him parents who sin against him and do not confess that sin to the child? A child will do nothing but look and point and say, see, I knew it. Hypocrite. Why would I want to be like you? Why would I want to follow your God? Let that not be said of us. If you sin against your child, confess that sin against that child to that child and urgently ask for forgiveness. Include confession to your children. None of us is above that. Notice also that Elijah had a nature like ours, but he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and so it did not. That was a great thing, but he was led by the Lord in that thing. And how long did he pray that? The implication here is that he prayed continually for three years and six months. And then when it was time to change whatever was going on, which was drought, he prayed again and it gave rain. He was, he was continually in prayer. How much should we be in prayer? We should continually be in prayer. But now... Do not expect that God will give it to you, number seven here. Do not expect that God will give you the answer to your prayer all at once. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 30, we see this. God is about to give the promised land to the Hebrews, to the Israelites, and he says this, I will send my fear before you, and I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come, and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out before you in one year, 
lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and inherit the land. So my question is to God, God, when you save my child, what's that going to look like? How will I know? There's a principle here in Scripture that God sometimes does not do it all at once, but little by little, slowly by slowly, as we would say in my house. Your child's conversion may be quiet. It might even be reluctant. God may have to drag your child into heaven by the hair, kicking and screaming. Let it be that way. That's okay. He had to drag you by your hair sometimes too, I think. And me. Wait a sec. (laughs) We're talking about advantages. I got that one. Number eight, as you pray, train your child. Train them up in the way that they need to be trained. We already looked at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in which way? In the way that he should go, not in the way his brother should go, not in the way that his sister should go. Each child is different. Each one is unique. They have a different way that they need to be addressed, that they need to be dealt with, that they need to be um, trained. They respond differently. Number nine, you can make an appeal to God for your children. We have, we have precedent for that. In Job chapter 1, by the way, you can make a, an appeal to God for your children, and you need to, and I need to, because God doesn't have grandchildren. My children are not saved because I'm saved. That would make them God's grandchildren. God only has children. We have grandchildren. Job chapter 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. That sounds sounds like the Stauffer farm. So that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses each on his appointed day and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, according to the number of all his ten children, for Job said this, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Job was in the practice of making sacrifice and beseeching God for the salvation of his children regularly. This is a good model for us to follow. God honored Job, and we see that it ended very, very well for Job, although he went through a very rocky, rocky time. It ended well for Job, and I think it began well for Job because he was a faithful man, and because he beseeched God regularly, maybe weekly or daily, regularly for his children, that God would work in spite of their possible sin. Isn't that amazing? There's no guarantee there. But but we see that God honored that heart. He honored that heart. Number eight. Teach your children and your grandchildren. You were waiting for this. My children are all gone. They're grown. They're gone. What do I do now? Oh, but you have grandchildren. Let's talk about grandchildren. Before I talk about grandchildren, I'm going to tell you about grandparents. Grandparents mentioned in the scripture. Grandparents are the storytellers. We tell stories. Stories of old. As my kids would say, Dad, back when you were alive, (laughs) did they have, fill in the blank, telephones? 
Yes, back when I was alive, we had telephones. Here's the thing that we're going to see as we look in these several scriptures about, about teaching. These are talking about teaching our children and grandchildren. Notice as I read through these that the teaching is not done by the church. Teaching is not done by a school. The teaching is not done by a government. The teaching in each case of these scriptures is done by the parents and the grandparents. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. So this is your story. The things that your eyes have seen, this is your story. Now what are we supposed to do with that? Unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children. Teach what to your children? Teach the things that you have seen to your children. Tell the stories of back when you were alive. (laughs) You're supposed to tell the stories. And it continues this way. And teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. Grandparents, you have a job to do. You're supposed to be the storyteller about how you came to faith in Christ, about the hard things that you went through, about how God picked you up and brought you through the storm, how God brought you through the sea. He parted the sea for you, whatever it was that that was the sea for you. What is it that you overcame? What is it that, that God defeated in your life for you? Tell that to your children and to your grandchildren. Have you shared your testimony with all of your grandchildren? If you haven't yet, make it an objective to do that in the next X amount of time, the next year or so. Yeah, I think I'll make a plan for that as each one of them turns 10 years old. No, don't wait. Why would you? We just saw an example two weeks ago. Our 18-year-old son was just walking around happy and smiling, and his heart stopped, he fell on the ground, and he was gone. Just like that. You don't know that your children and grandchildren have more time than that. You don't know that you have more time than that. Why would you say, I will wait until each one of them is 10 years old? I'm not saying that you said that. I'm putting out a principle here. Do it now. Do it soon. Do it at your next opportunity. Tell them the story of how you came to faith in Christ. This is your job. This is a command to Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. Teach them to your children and to your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb when the Lord said to me, gather the people to me and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. You're supposed to teach them especially what? Especially how God approached you in your desert and brought you to him. This is your job. I'm going to skip the others. They're in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 11. And as you teach them, Proverbs 23 verse 13 says, do not neglect the discipline of your children. Do not neglect to discipline them. Spank them yourself. You shall spank them and they will not die, says the scripture. Number nine, ask God to bring someone else to help lead your children. As you are praying, remember that you are not alone. You get to do just part of the job. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 10. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed? As the Lord gave to each one, I, Paul, planted. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. Pray that your children and your grandchildren would have somebody else who is not you come into their life and build upon the foundation that you have laid in their life. Now, you you may be looking and saying, but I laid a lousy foundation. I was a bad witness to my child. You know what? God can redeem that. (laughs) 
You are not the builder, and neither am I. If you laid a poor foundation, ask God to make perfect the foundation. And ask God to bring in somebody else who does it better than you to teach your children in a better way that you can or in a way that they will listen to finally. Have you ever done this with your child? You tell them something, you go through a whole story with them, you instruct them in something, and, and they go, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, mm-hmm, whatever. And then like a week later or a year later, they're suddenly all excited about this new thing that they just got taught that day. Daddy, daddy. I just learned something. Really, son, what was it? Oh, well, it's, it's this, that it's really good for me to put, that I have to put on a jacket when I go outside when it's cold. Oh, really? I never would have thought of that. Don't be offended. <laughs> Don't be offended when somebody else does the exact same thing that you did and says the exact same thing that you said and your child completely disregarded it. And now, because they've heard it from somebody else who is a prophet outside your home, now they want to get excited about it and now they want to obey it. If that something is salvation, praise God that somebody else was sent by God to save your child. Number 10. You have been given a house. Dedicate your house. And I don't mean the structure. The house is everybody in it. It's the policies of the house. It's the love of the house. It's the relationships within the house. Dedicate your house to the sincere, truthful service of the Lord without hypocrisy. Joshua 24. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's more than a quaint saying. It's more than a poster on a wall. It's more than a sign on your doorpost. It's a dedication to the idea and the principle that I am in charge of this house. God has made me master of this house. And while anybody is on this property, they will understand that this family, this property is dedicated to the service of the Lord. We will serve the Lord. What do you do? When your children say, you can serve the Lord all you want, but I'm just not into it. Don't take me wrong when I say this. That's okay. It doesn't negate the fact that your house is dedicated to the Lord. It does not take away any of that. All of our children need to approach God as individuals. They approach the throne of grace. Just because I dedicate my house to the Lord is not a guarantee that everybody in it will serve the Lord. But this house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So those who are in my house who are following me, we're serving God. If you choose to be a rebel in my home, you will show respect. You will not rebel openly while you are in this house, in this family. It will not be tolerated. but neither should we crush them when they choose not to obey God. I've been through this. You all know me and my family. We've got a lot of kids. Some of them are going to be better than others at different times in their behavior. I'll just put it that way. It should never be used as an opportunity to pounce, to crush, to destroy the spirit of that child. Oh, there are many nights. Many nights that we have gone to bed, Ruth and I. And you know, I mean, I've told you the stories. I fall asleep in seconds, not minutes. But my wife will stare at that ceiling. I get up the next morning and sometimes I ask her, when did you finally fall asleep? I don't know. Late is the answer. 
we continue to pray for each one of those children that we don't crush them while they are exploring, while they are testing their boundaries, while they are deciding whether they are going to also follow the Lord. I'll tell you this, the journey of faith, my journey of faith was marked, pockmarked with rebellion from time to time. Possibly your journey of faith was the same. Why would our children's journey be any different than that? If the Lord is long-suffering towards us, should we not be long-suffering towards our children? Yes. And so, remember that as our children are deciding whether they will follow God, they are also they're acting it out in a way that they are deciding whether they will follow you and me. And so you have this picture of a family that can appear to be divided because different people are, for a time, choosing different paths. But that same family can be united by love in the meanwhile. <laughs> Number 11, do not provoke your children. While they live with you and even while they don't live with you, don't provoke your children to anger. Ephesians chapter 6, you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There's that training again. Dads, I know that moms are the ones who stay home uh, oftentimes or spend more time with the children. And I know that they're constantly teaching, but there's something special about the teaching of dad. It's different. Just like there's something different about the discipline of dad, right? Wait till your father gets home. No, no, spank me now. <laughs> Not daddy. Um. There's a way to handle our children, even firmly, even with a disciplinarian's hand, that will not provoke them to wrath. And at the same time, we retain the right to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Here's what children are looking for. They're looking for sincerity and consistency. I have found that most children don't really care if they disagree with you. But if you're going to have a different opinion than them, they will respect that if you are sincere in it and if you are consistent in it. Yeah, my dad's a jerk, but he's a consistent jerk. Right? He's not fickle. He is not tossed about by every wind of doctrine. He treats me the same way he treats my brothers and sisters. He's not one dad at home and another dad in the public community putting on a smile and pretending everything's all good at home and sweet and then coming home and being harsh and stern and bad to me. Children can deal with a firm hand at home and can deal with difficulty at home if you don't go out into the world and portray an image that life is beautiful and I'm a perfect dad. Dads, this is for you. And number 12, never stop praying for your children's souls. Never. And in all your praying, continue in holy living. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. Test all things and hold fast to what is good. Chew the meat, spit out the bones. Abstain from every form of evil. Rejoice always and pray without ceasing, says 1 Thessalonians. But eventually... We have to stop praying, right? Yes, and I'm going to tell you when that is. You stop praying for your child's soul when one of you stops breathing. This is what we have done. Our son stopped breathing, and so I stopped praying for his soul. But there are eight more. And, God, and I'm not finished yet. And God is not finished yet with them. 
and I will pray for them until I die or they do. So, is there a special covering for the children of Christian parents? I think that we have just described that there is special power in the prayer of parents, Christian believing parents. There is a special ability and opportunity to live in a non-hypocritical, upright way, walking steadfastly in holiness and obedience to God that gives your child, it gives your child a leg up an advantage that no other child on earth can have. It is not a guarantee. It is not a promise. But your children have such an advantage. I think it's special. It's different. Your children are holy unto the Lord. And that is how we should pray for our children. I'm going to pray for everybody's children here now. If you are a parent, a step-parent, an adopted parent, and you want the pastor's prayer for your children, for the salvation of your children, you can stand up right now, and we will pray for them. If you are not a parent, and you want to be a parent someday, I'm going to pray for your future children, too, if you will stand up right now. Lord God, we are people of prayer. We call on your name. We claim your long-suffering nature. We feel comfortable that you have commanded us to approach boldly to the throne of righteousness. And so, God, we are at your throne room door right now. And we pray, we pray for our children, for our future children. We pray for our grandchildren and our future grandchildren. Lord, how should we pray? Lord, first, first God, make us a consistent witness. And as those children are conceived, God, we ask you that they be conceived in holiness. We recognize that you are mindful of each precious life that is conceived. Some of those children, God, we will never see because they are spontaneously lost in the womb. God, we pray for them too. Many of us here today have lost children we don't even know about. We know, God, that you have drawn them straight into heaven. And that's a topic for another whole sermon. Lord God, we pray that you would make us righteous parents and grandparents, consistent and holy in our witness before you and before man and before our children and grandchildren. God, give us a spirit of humility that we are not too proud to confess our sins against our children to our children that we would ask them for forgiveness. We pray, dear God, that you would make us steadfast in our prayer, that we would never, ever cease to pray for our children and our grandchildren, even before they are born. And we pray also, Lord, that for our future, the spouses of our, the future spouses of our children and grandchildren, we don't know who they are. Maybe they're not even born yet, some of them. We pray for them nonetheless. We pray, God, that you would bring our children into holy matrimony, into marriages that are dedicated to you. And those who are a part of marriages that one believes and one disbelieves, God, we pray for the lost spouse. We thank you, God, that that is a Christian home nevertheless. We ask you, God, for your holy covering on our children and grandchildren. 
in the sense that, as we have just described, it is not a guarantee, but it is an advantage. We pray, God, that you would exploit that advantage and show us whatever we can do to be more consistent and to be a better teacher, trainer, discipliner in righteousness to our children and grandchildren. And God, we recognize that it is not all about us. We really don't care who it is that brings our children and grandchildren to you. Lord God, bring somebody else into their lives who has a better voice to their heart, better than mine, better than all of us here. Lord, bring a better man to my kids and my grandkids. Bring a better woman or somebody whom you have just anointed for that occasion. And we ask, God, that in this way you would bless our generation, our children's generation, our grandchildren's generation, even to a thousand generations hence. In Jesus' name we pray, and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.